Welcome everybody to the first ever Google Hangout here in the House of Lords in support of Lord Sarch's Medical Innovation Bill. My name is Max Pemberton and I'm your chair for today. So you and your followers have a genuine opportunity to change the course of medical history, to help patients and doctors innovate and find new cures and treatments. The Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, has promised that if you tell him you want the Medical Innovation Bill by responding positively to the Department of Health consultation, then he will pass this bill into law. So it's incredibly exciting. Um, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves and then to speak for five minutes or so about why they support the bill. Um, I suppose we should start on my left with uh, Lord Saatchi. Yes, I'm Maurice Saatchi. I'm, I'm very, very pleased and grateful to see you all. And I, I will... Should we go around the panel and then I'll speak, or do you want everyone to introduce themselves, Max? Or perhaps, what? We should, um, perhaps we can each of us can introduce ourselves. Yes, yeah, sure. I'm Maurice Saatchi, and welcome to the, to the hard-working end of the Palace of Westminster. I'm Mavis Nye, and I have mesothelioma, so I'm very interested in this bit. My name is Dean Fennell. I'm a um, consultant physician and professor of thoracic oncology based in Leicester. We treat patients with mesothelioma who are researching new drug based treatments for the disease. I'm Dr. Ian Hansen, I'm a reader in viral oncology from the University of Manchester. I have an interest in any virus which has a proven or suspected link to human cancer. I'm Debbie Gunner, um, and I have an interest in teenage cancer. I'm Michael Summers, uh, I lost my best friend's cancer. I'm Alex Smith, I'm um, the chief executive of a charity called Harrison's Fund, we're fighting machine muscle dystrophy, and I'm presenting on the same page. Can I start with that? So, perhaps the best way to start would be to thank you all for coming, and thank you all for the interest that you've shown in, that you've shown in this bill. I have no doubt that your interest is what has led to the government deciding to adopt this bill and make it a government bill and the consultation documents will probably go out this week. David Hackett from the um, Department of Health is here and he will answer any questions that you've got in terms of logistics. The, perhaps the best way to, for me to start is to say that you would be forgiven for looking at me and saying, well, here is a man so distracted by grief that he thinks he can cure cancer by an act of parliament. So I think I should say right away that this bill is not going to cure cancer, but it will encourage the man or woman who will. And that's the reason why David's colleagues at the department, the Secretary of State himself and the Prime Minister have supported the bill and taken it forward as a, as a government bill. The Prime Minister himself says that his vision for the NHS is, as he puts it, every clinician a researcher and as he puts it, every willing patient a research patient. Unfortunately, that's unlikely to come true under the present law. And I will explain, if I may, if I may why that's the case. I'll have to go into the current law for a few minutes to, to make this clear. And I think it's very clear to all of you now, but I'm going to spell it out again for, for what it's worth. The, the basic premise of this bill is that all cancer deaths are wasted lives. I don't mean that in the sentimental sense that if only my mother, sister, brother or daughter had gone on to fulfill their... I don't mean that at all. I mean it in the strictly mathematical sense that science does not advance by one centimeter as a result of all these deaths. Why is that? It's because the deceased receive only the standard procedure, the endless repetition of a failed experiment. Why is that? Because under current law, any deviation by a doctor from standard procedure, if anything goes wrong, is likely to lead to a verdict of guilt for medical negligence. Why is that? Because current law defines medical negligence as deviation from standard procedure. But as innovation is deviation, so non-deviation is non-innovation. Under the current law, just to be clear, the doctor is obliged to stick to the well-worn path 
even though he or she knows it leads only to poor life quality followed by death. Between the doctor and the patient, it, let, let's say that we're speaking of a, a cancer patient um, whose situation is very serious. The doctor, being a decent human being, would like to attempt some kind of innovation. But at that moment, between the doctor and the patient in the bed, a red light comes on in front of the doctor. And it says <coughs> that he has to ask himself, does he want to go ahead along, he or she, want to go ahead along the path of innovation, of deviation from standard procedure? If he does, she does, and anything goes wrong, his entire livelihood, his reputation, and his family are all put at risk. For a cancer doctor, therefore, the only safe path in law is to play it safe, the status quo. This is how current law inhibits medical progress. The preeminence of standard procedure is a flat contradiction of the logic of scientific discovery and the whole majestic scientific process comes to what we might call a dead halt at the bedside of the cancer victim. That's why the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State have supported this bill and are taking it forward. That's why so many doctors and professors, many of whom are around me here today, but who have worked on the drafting of this bill over the last year, put to me, they put this case very bluntly. I'm quoting here the the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford, who says, there will be no cure for cancer until real doctors with real patients in real hospitals can attempt some kind of innovation. And the Dean of Medical Sciences at Oxford, who is one of the key uh, mentors of this bill, who says, um, an inspiring phrase, that um, one patient can change the world. So that's what, that's what this bill is about. I hope you won't let anyone tell you that cancer is under control. I, I know you won't. That's why you're here. The view that cancer is under control has the merit only of originality. So what is the, what is the solution that this bill will take forward? Um, it, it's, the bill says this. We want there to be more freedom for doctors to innovate. On the other hand, we don't want doctors to be able to do whatever they want. We don't want patients to be treated like mice. We don't want reckless experimentation which puts patients' lives at risk. But we do want bold, scientific, responsible innovation. This bill achieves both ends. It clarifies and codifies for doctors, the courts, insurers, what is best practice in innovation. It removes the uncertainty and the ambiguity which now surrounds um, a trial after a, an uh, unfortunate event. And it provides what one of the um, leading justices in the land describes as, I'm quoting him, a clear path to lawful innovation. I think at, I think at that point I could, I could hand over Max to others um, we could come back to we could come back to more details about the bill later, but I think, in summary, the good doctor will be encouraged by this bill. The bad doctor will be more easily exposed. That I hope you agree. I know you agree. It's a fine achievement for an eight-page act of parliament. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Lord Archie. Um, if I can move to my right, um, uh, Debbie Binner. Now you've got a very personal. Um, story about why you support this bill. Yes, yes. And first of all, I want to take you on a journey. Today, out there somewhere, a teenage girl is about to hear the worst of news. Whilst her friends fret about which hot boy fancies them or how popular they are on social media, this poor girl <coughs> will be told that she has cancer. And her world, and that of her family and friends, will fall apart. I want you to imagine the unimaginable. Ask yourself, what if she was mine? Seven people between the ages of 13 and 24 are diagnosed with cancer each day in the UK. Leukemia is the most common cancer, followed by those of the central nervous system. The cancers, 
in this group that the teenagers get are very different from children and very different from adults. And they are most, nearly always the most aggressive. So back to our teenage <laughs> girl. Today will be the worst day of her life. What lies ahead for her? If she's lucky, and I use that term of course with irony, she will have leukemia. The treatment will be horrendous, but she'll have a good chance of survival. The treatment of leukemia has been one of those very few success stories that uh, Lord Saatchi has spoken about in a world of cancer where there has been very little movement. In the 1970s, leukemia was a certain death sentence. And because of things like this, because of initiatives like this, now almost 90% of children and young people survive. But what if she has one of the other cancers, such as bone cancer, a sarcoma, or neuroblastoma? The horrors that lie ahead for her are really beyond most people's imagination. Let's go for bone cancer. There are two main types of bone cancers that teenagers get. They're called osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. There are others, but they're the two main ones. And the problem with bone cancer is it's in the bones. And if you've ever broken a leg or hurt your bone in any way, you will realize just how excruciating that pain is of bone cancer. And that is the backdrop of all the treatment, excruciating pain. Despite this, most adolescents with bone cancer are dismissed by their GPs as having a variety of other illnesses, from juvenile arthritis um, to growing pains. And misdiagnoses and delayed diagnoses are really common with teenage cancers, as they are with children and with some adults. I guess teenagers are just not supposed to have cancer, and GPs are guilty of this, as much of this bias as the rest of us. Once diagnosed, they're given a cocktail of various drugs. Those of you who have had anything to do with cancer may remember or recognize the following, um, the following chemicals. Methotrexate, iphosphamide, and etoposide. Etoposide being one of the most revolting. Common chemotherapies in bone cancer and, and in other cancers. They are known as the worst possible chemotherapies to have. The drug cocktails they use for bone cancers and the accompanying long and short-term side effects wouldn't be out of place in the script for Silence of the Lambs. Complete hair loss at 15 must be so hard. But believe me, that's the easy part. Life-threatening infections, weeks in isolation in a hospital room with no window, premature and irreversible menopause, heart failure, kidney failure, nerve damage, shingles. If you've ever had shingles, that is a pretty bad one. And to top all of that off, a secondary cancer. Because chemotherapy is the type of treatments that, that doctors are able to use now. There is a very real risk of a secondary cancer. A doctor once said to me that early 21st century chemotherapy treatments will be regarded by future medics as the, with the kind of contempt that today's doctors reserve for leeches. They kill the cancer all right well, in the short term at least, but they kill a lot more as well. And as if they didn't do enough damage to the body, they kill the spirit too. And I think that is almost one of the worst things about the whole journey. At this point, once again, I ask you to imagine and to ask yourself, what if she was mine? A bone cancer diagnosis when you're only 15 isn't the best of news. If you're lucky, you'll avoid amputation of one of your limbs. But not everybody is lucky. Even if this happens, the brutal reality is that your chances of survival are pitifully low and haven't shifted in about 30 or 40 years. You may naively expect your doctors to roll up their sleeves and assure you that they will throw everything at this. The stakes are so high, this is your child. You'll expect no stone to be left unturned in trying to find you a cure. You'll think any pro new promising treatments will be made available. If not here, then of course in the US. But this won't happen. Your doctors will probably avoid your eye contact and sometimes even avoid you together altogether. Your doctors will talk about processes and protocols. They won't tell you about a promising new treatment that was pulled years ago by a pharmaceutical company because kids, young people's cancers just aren't commercially viable. The story of a drug, an IGF-1 inhibitor called fidutinumab, is worth a look at. It's an especially good example of this disgraceful behavior that just goes on all the time without being outed into the public domain. Look deeper, and you'll find that the treatments they're proposing for you are over 40 years old, and the protocols over 15 years old. 
few new treatments are available and if there are any you are going to have to be extraordinarily lucky or have enough energy and the right high level contacts help to get on them. God help you if you are running short on either of these. The few clinical trials that bother to include the rarer type of cancers that young people and children get will, almost without exception, have bizarre entry criteria that make no clinical sense whatsoever, such as a trial for a cancer that predominantly affects people aged 15 with a lower entry criteria of 18. You just couldn't make it up, really. You may well look into your doctor's eyes and shout and scream and complain and beg. He may well be sympathetic. He may well be very kind and really care about your child, but he may well do absolutely nothing and rest wearily back on those tried and tested, extremely conservative system that has some pretty strong evidence to support the fact that it is very unlikely to work. That child was, is mine. Excuse me a minute. Her name was Chloe and she died a year ago this Friday when she was 18 years old and one month. She was popular, self-assured, charming and very, very beautiful both inside and out. She was blessed in that she was loved so much and her death has left the deepest hole in our lives. A few of those people are here today, along there. <laughs> Sometimes I dare to imagine the unimaginable. What if six months before Chloe died, in August 2012, when all hope was almost gone, she had been entered into a special category that doesn't exist, yet desperately needs to exist. A special category where all bets were off, all the rules no longer apply, and all the prudent methodologies of the medical profession, and indeed the Hippocratic Oath itself, need to be swept off the table and smash onto the floor. And I know I go further than Lord Saatchi in this, but once Chloe had only got six months left to live, how could any radical potential new treatment, I prefer actually innovative rather than radical, have been defined as too risky or too dangerous? These words, risky, dangerous, are utterly meaningless in this context. What if doctors tried something different, something new, something promising? Chloe may well have died anyway, and I accept that. But surely what she would have left behind would have been more clinically valuable to other children, to other teenagers, our most special commodity. And for us, maybe, we could have kept faith a little longer. Of course, we didn't want her to suffer anymore, although it's important to remember that dying of cancer isn't a walk in the park either. And there is always a risk of making things worse. I know that. And of course, things have to be done with caution and with great care. But there are drugs coming down the pipeline, and they are showing huge promise. Professor Andy Pearson at the Royal Marsden refers to now as the golden age of drug development. We desperately wanted hope. Chloe desperately wanted to live. She didn't want the medical establishment to give up on her, and neither did we. She didn't get those drugs, so the only medical advance resulting from Chloe's death was reproving for the zillionth time that an old protocol with old drugs doesn't work. No real useful contribution to medical science there, then. There's a huge problem treating rarer cancers and rarer illnesses generally. The fact they are rare means that there isn't enough data and there aren't enough people to test new treatments. We wanted to be one of those people to help other people. If we won't save our child, we wanted to help other people. Even if Chloe had died anyway, whilst on some new, untested and risky treatment, her death would then have helped advance the science in that new arena. Her death might have given a greater survival chance to that child who is being diagnosed today. We desperately need this new special category so that doctors can try radical things when they know the existing drugs won't work. We need to support this medical innovation bill. It's simply the right thing to do. I cannot have my dearest wish to have my daughter back with us. So I'll go for my second wish, to use my family's story to ensure that the next Chloe who comes along, and so very sadly there will be more Chloes, will have a better chance of life. Thank you very much for listening. Debbie, thank you so much. Um, and next I'd like to hear from uh, Mike Thomas. 
I grip the lectern tightly with both hands to try and pre prevent myself from breaking down with emotion. It was nearly a year ago. That lectern was at the front of St. Mark's Church in Purley, and I was starting to speak at the memorial service for my best friend. In front of me were hundreds of faces, young and old alike, people whom I'd known for years and people whom I'd never met before. But they were all there for the same reason. They were there to celebrate and remember an ultimately short but extremely well-lived life, the life of Chloe Drury. I wish I could be begin to describe how truly amazing Chloe was, share memories and anecdotes, and let you gather an understanding of the impact she's had in all of our lives. But regrettably, I would never be able to find the words that accurately capture just how wonderful she was. And it would be an injustice to sign, try and summarize her whole character in this brief speech. Instead, I wanted to talk today about what it was like to lose Chloe, lose such an amazing person, and to lose my best friend. On Wednesday, the 27th of February last year, I received a call. My friend sat me down, she looked me in the eye and told me that Chloe was going to die and there was nothing anyone could do anymore. It was going to happen in the next few days. I wasn't prepared to hear that, that Chloe was still alive but her fate was already decided. I sat in shock. I tried to ask questions about when it would happen, how did they know, but I wasn't really listening to the answers. Inside my head I was trying to make sense of what I'd just been told. All I remember thinking is that I felt helpless, desperately helpless. That night I stayed surrounded by friends. Trying to, trying to find comfort in each other, anything not to be alone. All, all night I rel relive the time I spent with Chloe, the first time we met, the days spent in her company, the last time I ever saw her. I thought about her dreams and her aspirations, the things she'd been so excited to do, and now they would never be fulfilled. When the news finally came through early the next morning that Chloe had passed, there were no more tears, no more uncontrollable emo emotion, just silence. I was completely numb. Over the next few hours I had conversations that I wish never had to happen. To be the bearer of the worst news possible. To look people in the eye, friends and family alike, and tell them that Chloe had died. I had to watch them break down in front of me. It was unbearable. You forget how many people are affected by one person, especially someone as caring, outgoing and joyful as Chloe was. Over the next few hours, sorry, the following weeks, as I'm sure everyone would agree, were the most difficult. As a friendship group, we spent nearly every day together, making sure that no one was alone for too long. Being alone let you think too much. It allowed you to dwell, it let reality set in. It let you realize that you'd never see Chloe again, that you never got to say goodbye. These painful thoughts would stay with me for months. But you can't stay out of a normal routine forever. Eventually, you have to return to school. We had to return to everyday life. But no matter how normal you try and make it, it is impossible pretend, to pretend that nothing has changed. For me personally, my school attendance was almost non-existent. The last place I wanted to be was at school, because at that point in my life, lessons and exams didn't matter. Grades and university places weren't important. I'd lost a friend, and it stripped me of all my motivation. I had no drive. There were two undeniable factors that helped me deal with Chloe's passing. Firstly, the unwavering and resolute support that we received from all our friends. Dealing with this alone would have been undoubtedly impossible. Secondly, the sheer bravery and optimism of Debbie. Despite what she has had to endure, she is always looking for a positive. Debbie has turned losing Chloe into her driving force, and this is where her outlook has led, to the launch of a new foundation aimed at helping those who find themselves in Chloe's situation. It was Debbie that urged me to speak at St. Mark's Church, who gave me the opportunity to say goodbye properly. And when I stood at that lectern and I spoke, I felt I'd finally let Chloe know how much she had meant to me. And again, it was Debbie who asked me to speak today, allowing me to become, become involved in Create for Chloe, making Chloe the driving force in my life too. I hope her story becomes a catalyst for change, for innovation, and hope today I've given you an insight into the pain that losing a friend causes for young people like me. And if you remember just one aspect of my speech today, I urge for it to be this one. Chloe's death has brought about many questions into the red tape and bureaucracy regarding cancer treatments. But going forward, ask yourself this question. Have you done everything you could have? Were you bold enough, brave enough, to demand more, more innovation, more accessibility to cancer treatments, so that more lives are saved where possible? For Chloe and the hundreds of others who find themselves in her situation, make sure the answer is yes. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much. 
Um, and next we have Charlie Chan from the uh, Royal College of Surgeons. I think he's joining us via a Google Hangout. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm sorry that I cannot, I'm be, there sorry I cannot be there person. with you in person. This whole, this bill, resonates whole bill resonates strongly with me. Strongly with me. We treat cancer patients. We treat every cancer day patients every day in routine hospitals. In routine hospitals, and every day, normal and every day, normal people will face these difficult will face decisions, these difficult decisions along with their doctors. Along with their doctors, I think that we have got into. I think that we have got into a system where it is a system where it is extremely difficult for doctors to innovate. For doctors to innovate. Doctors are sometimes quite doctors good. are sometimes quite good, and particularly surgeons, who and might particularly creep surgeons who might creep at the edges. But to make big changes, but to make big changes, it's very difficult. It's actually very difficult. I think that we are stuck. I think that we are stuck era. in an era where the where adherence to randomized where trials, the adherence to randomized trials. And all it entails, and all it entails, provides a straitjacket for ordinary doctors. Provides a straitjacket for ordinary doctors in the community. I know that anecdotal evidence. I know that anecdotal evidence may inform, may inform, persuade, and may not persuade. But I think that having anecdote. But I think that having anecdote from innovation. Will from innovation will provide the hypothesis for new discoveries and for new discoveries and new I have one of those pet hates. I have one of those pet hates of dogma. I think of dogma. we have seen over the I think we have seen over the generations doctors and other people doctors and other people practicing in set ways in set ways. And perhaps not being able, and perhaps not being able to step back and look at things in a different and look way. at things in a different way. I'm not saying that I'm we not should saying that we should practice in an irresponsible way. In an irresponsible way, and I think this bill and I think this bill provides a really measured, a really measured framework responsible framework for people up and down the for country. people up and down the country. To try and make a difference. To try and make a difference for everyday people. For everyday people. I wish it this bill. I wish it this bill all the best. And I look forward to hearing. And I look forward later. to hear, hearing your questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next up, we have uh, Professor David Walker from the University of Nottingham, who I think is also joining us via a Google Hangout. Uh, sorry, Matt. Um, he's actually been called, he's on call, so he's oh. actually called, yeah, he's been called on to go and do some. Okay. Um, I think then we can um, open up um, to some of the questions from the, from the audience. Um, um, I understand, is, is there Professor Dean Fennell? Yes. I'm here to take questions, actually. Yes. I was wondering if you might be able to tell us um, how you think this bill will change your practice and what, what your hopes are for this bill. So my perspective is as a medical oncologist and I treat um, a specific form of cancer in the lung uh, and also an asbestos related cancer, mesothelioma, which is a rare cancer. So in justifying my support for the bill, what I'll give you is a, is, is a sort of background to why I think this is a very timely um, a bill. So. You know, we, we know that cancer is extremely common. It affects uh, one in three patients, um, adults, in a lifetime. And um, for most cancers that present late, uh, these diseases have to be treated with drugs. And the drugs very often don't have the capacity to cure the cancers. These are treatments which we term palliative. Um, the treatments may not have very high levels of efficacy of activity. And as a consequence, patients will be exposed, obviously, to side effects, as we've heard, without the necessarily the likelihood of actually having um, a benefit. There are some drugs, for example, that we use as standard treatments within the NHS that have response rates. These are the percentages of patients who will have a shrinkage of the cancer, where that rate is 
okay, between 4 and 8 percent. And so the vast majority of patients are not going to necessarily have a, a shrinkage of the cancer or even gain, in some instances, symptom control. They'll be poisoned and the drug will be futile. And this raises a whole other area of innovation that we need to be exploring, which is not just giving drugs to patients that we think are going to be active or not, but actually exploring ways in which we can predict whether a drug is going to work or not. And this is the area of personalized medicine and, and one of the, uh, the more exciting areas that we're seeing in, in cancer drug discovery and development. So in a disease such as mesothelioma, which I treat, which is a rare cancer, um, when we do give chemotherapy, and we only have one chemotherapy we can give, that chemotherapy will perhaps extend um, the suppression of the disease duration by about three months. So patients will get three months of benefit from that and may survive only a year with that treatment. Now, that's a standard therapy. We can give that to all patients, of which maybe uh, a fifth of patients won't even benefit. But what happens then when those patients relapse and their cancer grows again? We have no standard treatments we can offer. Now, we're in the wake of a revolution in cancer uh, drug discovery and, and cancer research. And we are now seeing um, approvals of drugs that are very active in specific genetic contexts. We know that cancer is a genetic disease. And if we see a mutation, there are drugs which can target those mutations very effectively. With the technology that allows us within rare cancers now to identify some of these mutations, there becomes this opportunity to explore the use of these active drugs that are perhaps licensed in the more common cancers uh, in these rarer diseases. And so by exploiting genetics in rare disease, we have new opportunities emerging. And this is somewhere where the bill uh, could be exercised uh, in practice. Of course, um, you know, using a, a drug that happens to be used in melanoma for mesothelioma because there's a common uh, gene, um, a decision to do that should be based on good science and with good consultation. It shouldn't be done recklessly. Um, but I think that in order to really accelerate what is, in the case of mesothelioma, actually a cancer that is uh, growing in incidence, we're, we're currently in the wake of an epidemic of this disease. It's only going to become more common. Uh, we really do need to accelerate the, uh, the developments and treatments that are available. And so I think this bill uh, will serve as a, as a fantastic platform for enabling that. And if I can ask you, um, I suppose I'm interested in the idea that um, we already have um, clinical trials that are in, are in place. Um, what, what's the difference, though, between the, the, what, what's the difference that this bill would add, as opposed to the, the normal processes that we already have within cancer treatment, and indeed within medicine? So again, I'll, I'll take mesothelioma as an example because the majority, the vast majority of trials that are being developed for this disease are being developed around standard of care. So the idea is, if you have a new drug perhaps you can add it to existing standard of care, but it still leaves a vacuum after that standard of care has been completed. And so when patients, as they will, relapse, they have no options at all. Okay, there are no standards that, that can be exercised. Um, I think the other problem with clinical trials, potentially the randomized, the large um, studies, that paradigm that we, we all um, work with in, in terms of defining efficacy, requires randomization. So patients very often will be randomized to receive a new drug or not receive a new drug. What happens to those individuals at progression? Sometimes we can do what is called a crossover, but if we're doing a large trial, it's never going to have a hope of getting a, a drug to license. Um, these things aren't allowed because it affects the endpoint, it affects the, the result of the trial. And so with the sort of innovations that we're seeing in the ability of drugs to target specific genetics very effectively, where the activities are actually remarkable in some instances, and we can see very exciting, very encouraging responses to some of these targeted drugs. Um, one of the questions that are being raised, and in fact, um, you know, in the US recently with a drug in lung cancer, the license was passed without the need for a randomized trial because the drug was so effective. And I think we're going to see more and more of these opportunities arising. And there are debates about the way in which we you know, try and pass effective therapy. Do we have to wait for the large international you know, randomized study that takes years? Or can we have a very, very strong efficacy signal in a small number of patients that gives us sufficient confidence this is an active drug with low toxicity and the patient should get it now? And if I could go to um, Mavis and I, um, thank you so much for coming. Now, are you, are you, are you, is it a, you're a patient of Professor no, Reynolds? No, no. But you have... No. 
the same condition that he specialises yes, in, is that right? Yeah. Could, could you talk about um, Yeah. Um, so I made this night. Um, I was diagnosed uh, with mesothelioma uh, and given three months to live for four and a half years ago. So I'm coming up to five years, which only 2% live to five years. Um, so I'm exhausting all their drugs and treatment <laughs> options. Um, I'm told by, by my oncologist there is no more treatment. I, I can have the same old, same old. I've had to spend my, lots of money and time knocking on other hospital doors. Searching for the country, <laughs> searching the country for treatment. As my mesothelioma is growing again, I feel so strong in mind, but not in body, that I can go on in treatment. So I'd like a phase one trial. Why not? Um, I sign. Um, I'm terminally ill anyway. I sign a, a contract in the consent form. So why can't I have a phase one trial? Um, I should have. I should not have to tra chase treatment. It should be all be in a central bank where my doctors can then look in and find it and say, you can have this. At the moment, I'm going up to London and so come back and say, I can have this. It, that shouldn't be on. So uh, I've backed this innovation bill, and when do I want it? I want it today, because I might not be here tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe, can, can I ask? So when you went to your doctors um, and you said to them, you know, look, all bets off, I'll, do, I'll, I'll have whatever treatment um, is around. What did they say to you? It can't work like that because it's too, it's too much red tape. She can only, sorry, my oncologist can only give me what's laid down in the National Health System uh, down in Kent there. Um, I come up to London and talk to Jeremy Steele and he tells me, yes, you can have this. So I go back to her and say, I can have this. We've done it and it hasn't worked. Now there's nothing. There's no, no more. But there are trials out there. There's a phase one, uh, phase one is it phase one, the command trial? Um, two. Two. Why not use it on me? Why have I got to sit and watch other patients get it um, and probably made ill? But, you know, why can't I have it? I will sign to say I won't sue. <laughs> you know, that's how I feel. I want it. This is, Lord Archie, this is something that uh, you know I'm hearing again and again. This idea of the frustration of patients because actually they they're willing to to, to put themselves forward for these trials, and then you know because of the bureaucracy, there's this kind of brick wall goes up. So it, how exactly will this the, the bill help doctors negotiate the bureaucracy that's already there? Because surely one bill can't rewrite all the policies in all the hospitals. Well, I mean, I think it's exactly as as was described by the by the professor and by Mavis, because the the current the current method of scientific advance. I mean, obviously, people are trying all the time to advance um, cancer treatment and find cures. The the current method of ach achieving that sort of scientific progress is called the randomised controlled trial, properly known as the clinical trial. Clinical trials are um, very long. The, the the average life the, the average term between the idea of a drug treatment and it being authorized is 17 years so the process is very long it's also hugely expensive a clinical trial for a cancer drug is likely to cost whoever the, the sponsor is a uh, billion dollars so that process is is very slow and it's one of the reasons why you've heard so many um, shattering stories about the the lack of progress so the, the, the process of scientific advance has been outsourced to the clinical trial. If this bill became law, the result would be that a doctor in a hospital with a patient, let's say Mavis, can see that the situation is very bad, or Chloe, and would be able to attempt some kind of innovation. The, the reason, that, the reason this, this Act of Parliament is so important is that it alters the existing nature of the existing law, which I should just explain in answer to your question. I think if I quote the president of the family division of the High Court, Baroness Butler Sloss, one of the one of the um, most senior judges in the country who's given us um, tremendous advice on the drafting of this bill. In a in a important test case, the current law is based on case law. It isn't in the statute as it would be if this bill became law. Um, in a case called Sims versus Sims in the in the High Court um, her final judgment said, I think I know it by heart, that if we, if what, if we waited for the Bolam test, which is the current um, test, 
uh, of the legality of an innovation. If we, she said, if we wait for the Bolam test to be fulfilled to its complete extent, no innovative activity like heart transplant treatment or the discovery of penicillin would ever be attempted. So what the judges are saying is that there needs to be a better balance between defensive medicine, which rightly doesn't want to put the patient's life at risk, and also doesn't want to put the doctor's reputation at risk. A better balance between defensive medicine and innovation. Under the current law, that's impossible to achieve. The balance is too much too far towards the status quo. This, this bill shifts the balance towards innovation in what the judges tell us is a safe way. So I think that's so the So just answer. to kind of clarify, so the Bolam test, if I, as I understand mm. it, I'm no legal expert. No. Um, but, but that is, um, the, it, it's a kind of test but saying kind of what the average medical practitioner would do and kind of consider to be acceptable. Is that right? Yes, it, it's, um, it's got a very clear, the, the standard procedure is the term that's yeah. used. And standard procedure, as you expect in the law, is very well defined. It's not vague. It's defined as that procedure which would have been followed by a responsible body of medical persons skilled in the particular area of medicine in question. I'm quoting exactly. That test, the Bolam test, puts everything on the judgment of the, the majority of medical opinion. On that basis, you cannot have innovation. Because innovation, by definition, is, as I said, deviation from the majority view. That's why Baroness Butler Sloss said, if you wait for the Bolam test, as just exactly as I defined it, to be fulfilled completely, no innovation would ever take place. That's why this bill strikes a better balance. But you understand, Dr. Pemberton, why it has to be a balance. Exactly. You can't just shift from the complete status quo to complete freedom. Yes. That's taken 18 months of drafting by um, so, some, of the, some of the most brilliant judges and most brilliant doctors in the country and the work of David Hackett and his department. Um, I mean, we, we've been speaking about cancer, um, but I wanted um, to come to you, um, Alex, um, to talk about um, the fact that this bill actually has implications not just for cancer, but also for, for other conditions. Yeah. Um, so my name's Alex Smith, and I'm, I run a charity called Harrison's Fund, and I've been asked here to talk a little bit about uh, a condition that isn't cancer. When Harrison was just four years old, I took him to his paediatrician thinking he might have a mild physical delay and may need physical therapy. Within two weeks, a blood test and a visit with a neurologist provided us with the most devastating diagnosis imaginable, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The neurologist explained to us that Harrison's muscles would rapidly deteriorate. He would lose the ability to walk, to use his arms, to bathe himself, to go to the bathroom on his own. Eventually, Duchenne would attack his heart and lungs, and the, the disease would take his life in his late teens or early 20s. We have nothing to stop it, he told us. It is 100% fatal. Harrison is now nearly eight, and we live each day with the knowledge that because he's got a duplication of exon 51 of his dystrophin gene, his symptoms continue to progress, and he continues he's on a steady and rapid physical de decline. Harrison's doing incredibly well considering that he has reached a plateau all children with Duchenne do around the seventh and eighth birthdays. This is a stage of progression that is marked by an accelerated decline. It is marked by shock, the shock of his legs buckling without warning, sending him tum tumbling to the ground. It is marked by the shock of not being able to open the jar he used to be able to. Fatigue, he's plagued by the fatigue of exerting great effort just to do normal things, like keeping his balance and getting up from the floor. Strategizing, thinking about how we organize and prioritize his day, and a day for the family that will not wear him out, yet still let him experience all the world has to offer. Disappointment, the searing real realization that he can't play organized sports. My lack of words or ad adequate comfort when he walks into the house fighting back tears because his brother or friends just rode off on their bikes and he can't be with them. Routine, daily stretching sessions and regular physical therapy appointments and doctor's appointments. 
and hanging on to what may be the last time he'll complete a task or have the energy to help me coach his brother William's under six rugby team. This is the time when kids are moving faster and pushing limits and growing and looking forward to the future. And I'm terrified that Harrison may not have one. Annual events like birthdays and the end of a school year are marked with conflicting emotions. They're marked by a relief that we were given the gift of another year and by grieving one less year that we'll have together. While these symptoms are heartbreaking, I'm also filled with a sobering reality that this is mild compared to what we'll face in the very near future. There is a train racing towards my little boy and I'm running as fast as I can to scoop him up and save him. But I'm acutely aware that I may not make it in time. We need to affect massive change to help stop that train. Children at any age, whether they're three or five or seven like Harrison, should be afraid of the dark, of the bully on the playground, of the monsters under the bed. But they should not be afraid of needles and biopsies and surgeries and falling and breaking bones. They should not be afraid of no longer walking or of being unable to feed themselves, or of losing so much strength in their arms that they can no longer hug their mums and dads. Most importantly, they should not be afraid of dying. This medical innovation bill has the very real potential to help doctors and clinicians slow down that train. In our case, the risk of doing nothing is not nothing. The risk of doing nothing is fatal. Fatal every single time. You never survive this. In any innovation in medicine, there's an element of risk. And between clinicians and patients, there has to be a level of permissible risk, particularly when the population is small and the need is great. In terms of acceptance of risk, our community has already demonstrated our philosophy on this. We have one option right now. It causes cataracts and growth stoppage and osteoporosis and weight gain and immune system suppression. And this drug is still being studied in, in the Duchenne population. There are debates over dosing and efficacy, and this drug doesn't even change the final outcome for Duchenne patients. Yet, our children's doctors prescribe <laughs> it and in fact encourage its use. It's part of the standard care for Duchenne. Through this use of steroids, we've already shown that we're willing to assume risk. We understand that the long-term risks of steroid therapy are known, and the long-term risks of a new therapy would be unknown. But it's also quite straightforward and simple logic that helps us understand that long-term risks can only become clear when something has been used for the long-term. And the only way to get to the long-term is to begin. We have to begin somewhere, sometime, and that time is now. What we are not willing to do is assume the risk of doing nothing. If a potential therapy shows promise of stabilization or improvement over what would be expected without any treatment, and it shows safety, then patients and parents should be given a choice to try it. Because at the end of every discussion assessment and assessment of a therapy, we must never lose sight of the reality that the risk of having Duchenne far outweighs the risk of most potential treatments. And our children must be the beneficiaries of our best effort and of our most noble intentions and of our greatest commitment to safety and speed. Because at the end of the day, these children are not statistics. They're not a commodity. They're not someone's science experiment. They could be your boys or your grandchildren, and they may not be, but the responsibility for saving them belongs to all of us. I believe we are close to a treatment. We are so close that my son Harrison is part of a generation that will either be the last to die from Duchenne will be the first to survive it. We must have a great sense of urgency and we must always remember that the children should not serve the science, but the science must always serve the children. My biggest fear is that one day we will not have been successful in getting the therapies we need and my son will look up at me and say, Daddy, could you have done more? With this bill and the innovation it would encourage, we have the potential to move forward and reduce Duchenne from a 100% fatal condition to that of a chronic one. The time is now. We don't have time to waste. Make time. Thank you. Um, I was also wondering, is there Professor Hampton? Hi. Um, I wonder if you had any, any comments. Oh, yes, certainly do. Um, firstly, I empathise with everything I've heard, and I totally agree, and I think this bill is is very important, and if I may, I'll tell you a story. 
about a recent discovery which has taken us a long time, far too long, to actually get into the clinic uh, as an exemplar of what the bill may, may have actually meant in terms of speeding this process up. Um, in 2002, myself and my wife Lynn, who's sat over there, um, came up with an idea that a particular type of antiviral drug which is normally used to treat HIV may actually work against papillomavirus. That's when we had the idea in 2002. We published our first paper on this. Uh, pap I should explain, papillomavirus is the virus that causes cervical cancer. And cervical cancer is very common if you look at the world today. One, in, one woman dies from cervical cancer roughly every two minutes in the world today. So this is a very common disease, and it, it affects younger women. It, it, you know, cancer is usually a disease of older people. Cervical cancer is unusual in that it hits mid women usually in their 30s to 40s. So it's, it's quite a, an unpleasant illness. And the, we came up with this idea that this, this drug might actually do work against papillomavirus, which is the course of agent for cervical cancer. And um, we published our first paper on this in 2006. Um, and the indications look good. And it's taken eight years from that first paper to get it into the clinic. Now you're thinking, this drug was already licensed for use in people by oral administration. We wanted to apply it directly to the cervix. So all we were proposing was a simple change of the route of administration. And it took eight years. Now to me, that it was way too long. And you know, it was not even a new drug. And the indications are we've just managed to do the clinical trial, and it could have fallen over at so many places. We did it on a wing and a prayer, basically. There were so many times when it nearly fell over, and I nearly gave up. Um, we, we, tried, we had to do so many different things to actually get us in, into the clinic. And eventually, we managed to do it with a, he's now a consultant, he's an ex-PhD student of ours, and he's now an obstetrics and gynecology consultant in Nairobi. And the results are actually looking pretty good for a phase one. We originally, we, we could only afford to do a phase one trial, but the results have been above, way above our expect, expect, expectations. And I believe the clinicians now tell me, I, I should say I'm, I'm a scientist, not a clinician. My clinician colleagues tell me this is what's called a phase one, two, because the efficacy results are so remarkable. And it just, it just grieves me that it's taken so long, eight years from the time of the initial publication, to actually get it into people. So this is a new use for an old drug. And I, I think there is a massive amount of, ex, of, 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 of medical innovation that could exploit this particular trap. For instance, thalidomide, the, the drug that was used with such awful consequences many years ago, is now known. <clears throat> it was discovered apparently quite by accident to work against multiple myeloma. Mm. And there are many examples like this that could be possibly exploited much, much better than they are being. And so I wholeheartedly support this bill. Thank you. Um, we've got kind of five minutes left or so, and I wondered if we could open it out to anybody in the audience that either wanted to, to make a comment or um, to ask a question. Yes, um, Robert Verkak. Um, I run an, an NGO in the area of uh, sustainable healthcare and integrated healthcare. One of the things that um, we would very much like to see is within the functional medicine community that we represent internationally, there's an enormous amount of innovation going on in the area of non pharmaceutical healthcare and integrated healthcare. And finding a way that there are practitioners working in the UK who have results that are so far beyond. Um, standard of care, yet they daren't raise their head above the parapet for being jumped on, on the GMC, by the GMC. So it's a similar issue, but I just wanted to raise the additional flag of non-pharmaceutical approaches in addition, and this works very well given the increasing amount of information on genetic polymorphisms, for example. So just to clarify, do you mean other other types of interventions, like surgical procedures and, and other... Yes, and, and the, the use of nutritional protocols, for example, as well, um, the use of some botanicals, things that, that essentially help the body to become stronger, to support the immune system, that can often work well in conjunction with um, existing standards of care. Yes. McGuart Caring Cancer Trust. Um, innovative treatment requires innovative research. Will this bill speed up the implementation of research? 
Well, the bill isn't isn't aimed at research. It's aimed at um, clinical practice with patients in hospitals. It's it's inevitable though that if the result of um, the attempted innovation is more learning, then that learning would be spread, and therefore it is a it's a surrogate for research. So in that sense, the answer is yes. But you raise a very important point though in terms of research, which is that for this bill to be effective. One of the things which Dave and his colleagues in the Department of Health are going to have to do is to make sure that the information that is generated by these innovations is spread around the medical profession and around the medical community so that people really do learn as a result. Otherwise, it's pointless. So I think David understands that. Um, and there's a question at the back. is another very hard to treat cancer. It's been a very emotional hearing some of the experiences here. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm quite a robust professional person and I have fought hard to find every option possibly feasible to help my mother because the prognosis for people like her is that you're going to have about a 4% chance of being alive in five years. Um, there are many people out there who are not willing or able to have those kind of fights. So as long as the mechanisms go with the bill to make sure that people do bring those treatments and that knowledge, gain that knowledge, take responsibility to gain that knowledge, the kind of centralized data store that was talked about, um, I, I've supported it from the start. I'll continue to support it vehemently, and it can't come soon enough. It really can't come soon enough. Um, we are lucky um, to have David um, Hackett here from the Department of Health. I just wondered, David, if you had any, any comments at all that you'd like to make about this bill. Um, yeah, if I just pick up the, the point about research, um, it's come up quite a lot in our pre-consultation phase. Um, and of course, um, the, the, there are two arguments really on, on that. Um, the, the, the first point um, I think Lord Saatchi made is, is quite Quite right. We, the intention of the draft bill is very much to, uh, where innovation has been successful, to share that knowledge out and into the medical community. Um, however, there is a, a sort of counter argument that by, um, in effect, putting this in the draft bill as being mandatory, that you you may create more barriers and and, and more bureaucracy. So we haven't we haven't included it as mandatory. We've just left it as a hope and intention. Um, but I, th I think that. The honest position is we haven't made up our mind, and it's a topic that very much um, one of the reasons why we're having the consultation. We very much welcome comments from, particularly from from clinicians, on whether that strikes the right balance, whether we're going to achieve that, um, or whether we need to, to 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 modify it slightly. So it's it's exactly what we're we're looking for in terms of, of comments, and I'd welcome anything that comes out of the consultation on that on that point. Thank you. We're out of time, unfortunately, but I'm, I, hope you, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, Google Hangout here at the House of Lords. Um, and please do respond to the consultation um, on this bill. Um, you can check out our website, which is sarchibill.tumblr.com. That's sarchibill.tumblr.com. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Can I thank Dr. Pemberton? Um, I don't know whether we're, we're still live. We're supposed to be counting to five so that they can oh. edit it. <laughs> oh my God. I can see people going one, two, three. <laughs> that's, that's pathetic. I'm really sorry. Should we do it again? Well, I, think it, I think that's it now. I think it's live. It's, it's oh. over. Oh, I will. <laughs> In that case, could I, could I, having messed up his entire, could I just thank Dr. Pemberton, who, um, as you know, is the health editor of the Daily Telegraph. Um, he has moved the Telegraph into a position of support for this bill. He's written about it. He's, he's um, galvanized opinion inside the Telegraph. And um, we owe him a most tremendous amount, particularly for today. Would we um, give him a round of applause? Absolutely. Please? Thank you. Thank you all very much. It's fine. I think there's enough of a...